Hey guys and welcome. Today we're going to be going through and explaining the pretty complex storyline of Atomic Heart. When going through the story, there are so many different key areas of dialogue just thrown into random sections of the game that it can be in fact quite difficult to follow at times and to figure out what's going on with who and what what means. And to be completely honest, I had to rewatch my entire 13 to 14 hour playthrough just to write this script and to actually understand what I just witnessed and what happened. So this video will be very helpful to a lot of people. This explanation video will work slightly different to the other ones that I've done on the channel. By the way, a playlist link below if you wanted to check those out and view any of the other ones. Just because in this game there's so much copyrighted music that I had to add all of my own stuff in over the top almost the entire way through. So that was fun. But nevertheless, I hope you guys are going to enjoy today's video. If you do, a like would be very, very much appreciated. Subscribe if you guys are brand new as well for plenty more content like this and much more coming to the channel over the years. There is going to be so much content this year in terms of new games, throwback reviews and stuff like that as well on the channel. So a lot of you guys will really enjoy that. But without further ado, everyone, let's dive straight in. Atomic Heart starts in a boat flowing through a river in the middle of a city known as Chelame. This place was built in order to provide all working here with a comfortable, peaceful and stress-free working environment. This city was built in the 1950s and is home to many leading Soviet scientists and even some of the German SSR. You must be extremely qualified and highly educated in order to even be considered to live and work aboard the Chelome complex. Here, robots are completely autonomous, helping civilians move objects, terraforming and even landscaping. They can do pretty much anything that you can think of. However, we then hear from a doctor, Sechenov. Sechenov programmed and gave us a glove in order to help us along the way, a glove that will challenge us in dialogue and also guide us across the land. This glove is named Charles, or Charles if you want to say it like that. Why it's pronounced in this way? Well, you'll find out a bit later on into the video. Sechenov designed this glove and exclaimed that it's more important than we might think. So be very, very careful with it. He wants us to report to the lab to complete our integration with the glove and someone by the name of Mikhail Stockhausen will be there assisting us. We dock the boat and begin walking down the pathway of Chelome. Here we can see that this is no ordinary 1950s setting, but a much more advanced one. Crowds of people lining up in a parade taking place in front of a giant headquarters. Civilians dancing with robots and busting out some moves to the street scientists preaching the exciting new technology called Collective and the Neuropolymer. As we walk toward the lab, here we see a true vision of the people, the leaders. Humanity to one day thrive in space, colonizing other planets across the solar system and then eventually the universe. Creating artificial atmospheres on these lands to support human life with the people of this facility eating up this propaganda. Anyway, onto the lab that we go, and at the front door, we're greeted with a robot. Us, Major Nikayev, known as Comrade Major, will today take a step into the future, known as Collective. Collective is the future of Soviet education, a project created by Dr. Sechenov. This was an idea conjured by Sechenov to allow all humans within the Soviet Union and eventually the world to be able to learn things almost instantaneously. All that you need to do is inject a special neuropolymer encoded with the education that you want to learn, a science degree, a new language, a doctorate in nuclear physics, or even learn an instrument in an instant. Collective allows you to be able to do this without any hard work involved. Our capsule has been specifically created to suit our needs personally, so we walk over and inject it into the glove. Anyway, as we walk outside, we start to make our way to Sechenov, seeing the parades of robots marching and suddenly, a giant screen shows Sechenov's face. Today is the launch of Collective, he says. This technology has been in development for decades at this point, and just look at how it's transformed the Soviet Union. The leaps and bounds that we've taken forward in technology just from this point. The invention of something called neuropolymers, the things we injected inside of us in the lab. And through the process of mimetic adaption, Dr. Sechenov wants to launch Collective globally in a new version called Collective 2.0, a network where humans and robots become one. 
where humans can control machines just with their thoughts alone. All of this can be done with one simple device, a neural connector. This connector is named the thought device. This device will be a part of a wider global network, placing all of the knowledge of humans into one big database, uniting all intellects across the globe into one powerful mind, free of all boundaries. Essentially, anyone that wears this thought device is able to learn anything that's in this thought database in an instant. And if everyone around the globe is wearing one of these devices, it's going to be just full of literally everything you can ever want to know. Anyway, we make our way into this building and take the elevator to the top and make our way through the door into the boss's office. Talk about style. Science is power, I tell you. The boss has a way of looking down on insurmountable obstacles. I really respect that. There are no obstacles science cannot surmount. Other than an electronic glove that never shuts up. Here is your vehicle activation code, comrade major. Got it. The vehicle is waiting downstairs. You should hurry. You don't have much time. Here we're greeted with two robots inside, the ballerina twins. We both give us a key to a vehicle waiting for us down in the courtyard. So we make our way back down there. However, as we descend down the elevator, setting up radios to us. He apologizes that he can't speak to us in person. However, with the launch of Collective 2.0, he's very much being swamped by any reporter that's able to get five minutes with him. However, we state that we love what he's built here in Chalamet and that there's nothing like it in the whole of the USSR, which is the Soviet Union. Humanity are on the brink of something special with that of Collective 2.0, and one day, we will venture out into the stars. Humanity was born to dream. However, unfortunately, there are those that wish to crush those dreams. And that's where men like us come in. Sworn to defend mankind and its destiny, it's a really important piece to note that when we address Sechenov, we always call him boss. We are very, very fond of him and extremely loyal to him too. However, more details on this later and it will become more apparent as to why. We make our way outside of the building and to our vehicle where a bumblebee attaches itself to us and we fly off onto our journey. It was in the car that we turn on the radio and we hear concerns being spread from the US around skyrocketing unemployment figures following the delivery of robotic workers from the Soviet Union. However, as we continue to ascend, facility 3826 is not just a normal city, it's a floating city, but not the only one. It's surrounded by many of them. We descend through the clouds, the weather starting to turn, and suddenly we see land. This whole place was designed from the ground up by the use of robots controlled by Collective 1.0. This was the design dedicated to the Soviet Union and how they were able to make such leaps and bounds in technology and innovation in the 1950s, even leading to the Soviet Union winning World War II and building a statue named the Majestic Call of the Motherland in commemoration of this exact feat. This place looks brilliant, right? Robots controlling the whole country, innovation miles ahead of anyone across the globe. This place couldn't get any better, right? Major, Petrova's initiating combat maneuvers. Initiating what? For real? Watch out! Out. What am I supposed to do about it? Safety. What the? Please do not unfasten your seatbelt until the vehicle has come to a complete stop. You have reached your destination. You are now at the laboratory gate of the Rebel Laptop. This is above all facilities. Have a nice day. Take my hand, Comrade Major. I will escort you to the Vavilov Complex. All robots have suddenly activated combat maneuvers and are actively trying to fight us. However, a Tereshkova robot escorts us to an elevator and...
We wake a short time later, and it wasn't looking good. We use our glove to pull up an axe wedged into the ground to help protect ourselves before radioing to Sechenov, codenamed Wizard. We ask him what the hell is going on here, and he mentioned that this is all the doing of a man called Viktor Petrov. He's a traitor who hacked into the collective central hub and caused the civilian robots to attack facility employees, and now the wider civilians of facility 3826. Petrov has the access codes to the hub. We need to find him and bring him to Sechenov alive so that he can stand down all of these robots so that they don't harm anyone else. We push our way down to the streets to try and find the complex entrance when suddenly we hear a voice from inside a porta potty shouting for help. As the noble citizens we are, we open the door and all we can see is a robot sat in the corner. So we peer down the hole to see if there's a human down there asking for help. And suddenly, the robot springs to life and attempts to suffocate us. When, out of nowhere, the robot receives a bosh to the back of the head by someone named Granny Xena. What are you gawking at? Almost choked to death there. Give me a hand. Oh, I didn't see that coming. She doesn't tell us much about herself. However, she does confirm our suspicion. Robots are attacking people. And those that couldn't find a place to hide are probably dead already. Granny Xena tells us of a complex below, and that if we want a weapon, we need to go down there. However, before we could finish our conversation, a Pachella comes out of nowhere, a robot with a portable camera, and we have around 30 seconds to get the hell out of here. Let's move your ass! 30 seconds until what? <sighs> 30 seconds until we're fucked, sonny boy. Royally fucked! Granny Xena calls us Beefcake and tells us to come here and turn a key before going absolutely fucking ham on the robots that are coming down. Suddenly, however, a bumblebee comes crashing down, letting loose a huge robot and sends us flying into the elevator. Jeez, man. Time for a quick smoke break, and then we can go on to the next part. We find ourselves inside of this compound called Vavilov. This is said to be where Petrov is located, so we need to locate him and bring him alive to Sechenov. However, there's a huge armored door in the way. We need to find a way to open it, and to do that, we need to find the handle. However, before we do this, we ask Charles a bit about Petrov. Petrov's betrayal was discovered by Mikhail Stockhausen, and Petrov was subsequently arrested by the Argentum unit, a squad of specialists loyal to Sechenov. But how did he end up here? After Petrov was arrested and sent to trial, he was sentenced to community service and ultimately sent back to Vavilov as a prisoner to continue his work. Because Petrov is so sought after and extremely knowledgeable, they had almost no choice but to bring him back and continue his work on Collective. And with Collective launching only a few months away at that point, replacing the lead designer would have been extremely foolish and really wouldn't have helped them at all. Petrov had to finish what he started, and that's exactly what they made him do as a part of community service. He was previously the lead engineer of a top secret department within the Academy of Consequence, dedicated to programming robots for Collective 2.0. Anyway, we finally find the handle to the door, and as we open it... As we make our way through this facility, we ask Charles for some more information on Petrov as he can grab information directly from a database of information. Petrov wasn't working alone throughout this process, and had several of us helping him out too. 
Technically speaking, Collective was not hacked at this point by Petrov. No one could possibly circumvent the algorithms that were created at the Academy of Consequence, which is essentially the location and the hub of where Collective was tested on different patients and things like that, but we'll learn more about that later on. However, these people must have introduced a false combat mode into one of Collective's algorithms that caused the central hub to see all humans were invading soldiers, which is why they're attacking normal civilians and also people within these labs as well. The scientists of the Soviet Union are able to fix this without Petrov, however it will take way more time and which in that time more and more people are potentially going to die, get hurt and the news of this incident won't just go across the Soviet Union to the governments but also across the globe and it will damage the reputation of Collective 2.0 in other countries, especially the US. Soviet robots are considered to be perfectly safe and reliable all over the world and they have been for decades. This is why Petrov's treason struck at the very heart of it all. Because of his acts against his country and their technology progression with robotics, he was imprisoned with treason and this has just added to that even further. He wants the entire world to stop using our robots. Does Petrov know something that we potentially don't know? Again, we'll find this out a bit later on. So we continue to push through the compound and move through a door when suddenly... Oh shit! Get up, soldier. <sighs> Great, just a little more. You okay? I'm fine. How many fingers? Uh, four. Great, now get up. I need your help. We wake a short time later to a voice that seems to be attending to us. She makes sure that we can see what's going on and tells us that we need to get up and help her. Two soldiers pulled us out from under the rubble, but we're injured by a large robot. This lady is a doctor named Larissa. However, as we pass her some equipment, we see a neuropolymer capsule on the countertop. We decide to leave the doctor to her devices because she wasn't being communicative with us and she didn't tell us any information about herself, who she was, what she did, what anything like that. We walk over to the capsule to heal ourselves, and Larissa was stunned at where we got that glove from and how we did that. However, suddenly, a robot smashes through the door and lasers straight through one of the soldiers. We finally take out the robot and continue to find Petrov. However, we come to a door. When we move through, the corridor's dark, with a lady singing a lullaby in the background. A lullaby? I don't like this. Charles, what's on the other side of the door? That's Nora's voice. She's very dangerous. Manipulator, quick! How titillating! Rebellious dominant men really turn me on. Oh, I'll turn you on, all right. Just let me at you. What a brute! Oh, I love tough guys. I'm on fire. Closer! I can't reach her. I'm trying. I'm trying. She's one strong ass bitch. I'm at your service, sugar. Anything for my master? What can I do for you? Oh my god, what is happening? <laughs> oh no, Nora, what are you doing? 
Much, much filler later into the game, we find ourselves at a cable cart compound below the facility itself of Vavilov, and Charles tells us where we should be able to find Petrov. He was working in the Vavilov cold workshop before everything turned sour, so we should probably start there. So we jump in one of the cable carts and make our way down the track. What could possibly go wrong? It was only a matter of time before something went wrong, right? <laughs> so we make our way through this place and have one or two close calls. Holy shit. Charles, that was a bit off, right? A tunneling robot. Indeed it was. Finally, we hear a voice in the background, so we go and investigate. And there is Petrov. Are you okay? Is everything ready? Did you pull it off? Don't worry, honey. I'm right as rain. The operation was totally painless. He seems to be talking to some lady. Larissa, the one that we seen earlier. The one that saved our lives and Petrov refers to her as Honey. However, it's very clear at this point that the Petrov has control over these robots, whereas they turn on everyone else. So, that's an interesting point as well. Well, you should have. It would have saved us a whole lot of trouble. That scares me when you talk like that. I'll meet you at the exit. I'm right behind you, Honey. I just hope we're not too late. Hope can be dangerous. Hands up! Victor? What's going on? You deaf? Hands behind your head. Victor! The hell Victor. are you? Major Nachaya Special Operations. And that's the last question you get. You're going to Chelemy. Victor, save yourself! Chelemy. Of course, Comrade Major. Intrusion. Huh? Intrusion! Warning. Hey, freeze! Warning. Get back to work. Lockdown in Petrov quickly escapes and takes a device that was holding the door open called a candle, which was the power object for this door, and without it, we're not able to get through. So we need to go and find a candle, and then push through to find Petrov. We find where Petrov had run to. However, it doesn't look too good. Petrov's head was decapitated by one of the rampant robots roaming the facility. We radio to Sechenov and tell him of the news. He's understandably disappointed with this news, and if the head was still in one piece, it could have been used to obtain the codes within his mind. Sechenov does ask us if Petrov's body had any gold rings on him. There were none, but he didn't really explain much more than that. What could these rings be, and why are they important to Sechenov? Sechenov wants us to report to the VDNH at once, as apparently we have bigger problems than Petrov to deal with. Stockhausen will debrief us there. So, let's get the hell out of Vavilov. We get back to the main room with this giant tree in the center, and in order to get out of Vavilov, we need to activate a generator for the facility, which happens to be this giant tree, called the PEC-4 Birch Tree. This tree, interestingly enough, would typically be the power resource for any colony when humanity attempted to live on other planets within the solar system. Although, to power the tree, we need to find four canisters, each one of these canisters filled with a cryopolymer liquid used for powering the tree. In order to obtain these canisters, we need to visit four workshops. The hot workshop, the algae workshop, the pesticide workshop, and then the cold workshop. We start off with the algae workshop, and here we can see that multiple scientists and subjects have all mutated into these zombie-like things. 
something must have went wrong with the sprouts that were being grown here after the malfunction took place. And as we walk through the compound, we also see a civilian gardening tool turn really hostile. This thing is, does not look like you want to mess with it. Shit, that Hedgie's lost it. Fuck my life. This is usually a harmless geodesic geology robot. Harmless my ass. Anyway, we collect the canisters from this room and we return to the tree. On the way back, Charles asks us if something's the matter. We mentioned that we're pretty angry that we didn't capture Petrov and didn't bring him back to Sechenov alive. Comrade Major doesn't like failing Sechenov. He saved his life. He's like a father to him. However, Charles makes a really good point here. How much of our old life do we really know? So what were we before now? We say we remember around two years or so previously, but not much before he got hurt. But more on this a bit later on. We collect the canister from the hot workshop and then move to the pesticide workshop to collect the canister there. However, the final canister was a little bit more difficult to obtain. Shit! Are you off your nut? Is this some kind of joke? Shh, shh. You, could, you could wake it up at any time. In two hours time in the pesticide reaches critical low, it'll wake up. Do you understand? I need a canister of pesticide polymer. There's a canister right there inside. You'll have to find a PA-400 polymer container. We blow the fucker to kingdom come, then you can take whatever you want, okay? Fine, have it your way. But won't the canister be destroyed? <sighs> Shit! The pump! The hemlock needs to be sprayed constantly. We're almost out of PA-400. You need to find that polymer container right now! Yeah, right, I can tell you. Could you at least tell me what it looks like? It's a yellow kind of, uh, kind of cylinder? The canister of pesticide polymer is inside the hemlock. In order to get it, we need to destroy the hemlock by just blowing it up and using a polymer container. The hemlock is being kept asleep by a solution named PA400. And we're almost out of it. And if this thing wakes up, it's probably going to kill us all pretty fast and gruesomely. We look around the workshop and finally find this yellow container and we send it where it needs to go. Rick. Did you find the container? I'm out of PA 400. If we don't figure out something soon, we're toast. Take it easy, pal. I found it. Look down there. There's your container. You got any idea what it took to get it here? Shit! Not like that. That won't kill it. You were supposed to blow it up. Damn it. What do we do now? It's awake. We gotta ignite the polymer. Give me your cigarette. You can ignite polymer with a cigarette? This one? Yeah. Die, you prick! Holy fuck, it's going ape shit! It's in rage! We gotta run before it... Hang on! God damn it! You okay, buddy? Yeah, we did it! Shit, Sprouts, get the fuck up! My leg is stuck. Shoot it already! There's too many of them! Hurry! I'm trying! If they get to us, we're dead! About aiming better? They're almost here! Get up! Get up! I'm trying! I'm trying! No! Fuck. No! Help me! Get it off me! Hang on, buddy. I'm coming. Oh, shit! The fucking canister. Well, it's something. He's mutated! No shit, Sherlock. Crispy crap! Get the fuck off me! Holy shit, that was insane. So, a quick lore recap behind these killer shrubs. Why the hell would they create these things? It makes absolutely no sense. 
Charles basically says that it was a scientific mistake. You can't avoid making mistakes if you don't try things that are new. So they were just containing this giant shrub monster that could kill everyone below ground. And rather than killing it, keeping it alive with this pesticide thing spray. <laughs> okay, okay. So now we have all four canisters, we return to the birch tree and get the hell out of Vavilov. We enter the elevator and as we ascend upwards, Charles tells us about someone named Chariton Zakharov. He was one of the head scientists from a while back and apparently an absolute genius. He died under very mysterious circumstances though. Dr. Sechenov is the only one who knows the details of his demise. However, the story that was cascaded out to the other scientists and higher-ups was that Sakharov slipped and fell into a lab bath full of hazardous experimental neuropolymer. However, the problem with that was, no footage was ever recovered of this, even though the labs are monitored 24 by 7, and neuropolymer isn't toxic, like, at all. In fact, it was something that we swam through whilst collecting these canisters, with no issues at all. And if it was a batch of neuropolymer that was toxic, do you not think that Zakharov would have known about it? Zakharov will be very important later on, again, just to reference that. We reach the top in the elevator, and Charles tells us that we need to reach Lesnaya Station and take the train to Solnechnaya. We will meet Stockhausen there for a debrief. We make our way outside and can seriously see the damage that these robots have caused. However, as we're attempting to make our way through to the station, we hear a familiar voice on the radio. Where's the fire, Sonny? Granny, is that you? So you haven't forgotten old Granny Zena, huh? Good for you. Granny Zena invites us to her place. However, when we get there, she doesn't seem to be there. So we ring this bell thing that's just kind of calling out to us. And suddenly, are ambushed by a huge robot, the one from the start. However, the robot met its match when Granny Zena's hut landed directly over it, crushing it completely. The stairs on the hut extended, and we make our way up to speak with Granny Zena. Well, I'm here now, Sonny. Thanks for the assist. Granny Zena, so, where are these big guns of yours? This cutscene is a very important part of the storyline, so just pay attention here. Kettle's there, help yourself. Uh, okay. Nice TV. What's on? Cartoons. Have a seat and watch. What the hell are you? <clears throat> Regarding Shush. the reports Your beloved Sachin, I've heard about the I want you to watch closely at facility 3826. The malfunction has already been corrected, comrade Molotov. Everything's back to normal. There's nothing to worry corrected about. Corrected or not, our American friends are likely to find out about this outrageous incident. Do you realize what this could mean for us? An international scandal. I am fully aware of- Are you? Our Atomic Heart Project My. is in jeopardy. My project. A project I started before the beginning of that damn war. A project you all refused to acknowledge. How many millions of Soviet citizens died in that bloody meat grinder of a war? I swore that the world would never see its like again. Well, well. I'm glad to hear you still value human <laughs> life over your mechanical toys, Comrade Sechenov. But that does not change the fact that we are all slowly being suffocated by Western sanctions. Comrade Molotov, I value human life above all else, and the age of capitalist exploitation is coming to an end. Soon the Western working class will cast off the yoke of the oppressor. I understand my duty all too well, Comrade Molotov. The polymerization of the entire Soviet population, the launch of the collective neural network, Operation Atomic Heart. What duty are you referring to, Comrade Sechenov? 
Do you even realize that if the Americans find out that your robots can be switched to combat mode, I guarantee your project will be dead in the water? They're not going to find out. I repeat, the malfunction has been dealt Comrade with. Comrade Sechenov, some members of the Politburo may be willing to take you at your word as an honored member of the Academy of Sciences. But I'm afraid your word is just not enough for me. What's that supposed to mean? Granny Zena isn't supposed to have this television feed, and no one is sure how she actually accessed it. But she shows us this meeting between the Politburo and Sechenov. The Politburo has come to a decision, and I have been ordered to head a special commission investigating your malfunction. We will be at your facility later today. Do I make myself clear, Comrade Sechenov? Well, Comrade Molotov, if the party deems it necessary, then... Holy shit, Granny Zena. How the hell did you get it's access to this? It's a direct connection. I've got eyes and ears everywhere, sweet cheeks. So, just to summarize this so everyone's aware, the Bureau, who are essentially the governing body of the Soviet Union, are meeting with Sechenov because of what's happened with his robots. They're not happy that this has happened as this could spark a huge amount of backlash across the globe from the countries that have purchased these robotic helpers from the Soviet Union. Comrade Molotov mentions a project called Project Atomic Heart. However, we know nothing of this just yet, but we will later on. This project was created before the war and the Bureau would refuse to entertain it. However, after they'd seen the success of these robots, they sided with Sechenov and agreed to sanction Collective 2.0 on a global scale. However, Molotov is enraged, as if the Americans, who have a lot of the Soviet Union's robots, find out that these robots can be switched to combat mode. This project and all of the work will be dead in the water. The same with the Soviet Union's reputation. The Politburo have advised that Sechenov's malfunction needs an investigation. So, Comrade Molotov will be here shortly to conduct this investigation. We must get to the train station to continue on, and learning about this, Sechenov is going to want us there. So, we make our way onto the train and get the hell out of here. We're laying on the platform, and then suddenly, Stockhausen sprints past us from the right. He tells us that Comrade Molotov is on his way to the VDNH. We must get there as soon as possible and activate something called an emergency drill. This is under Sechenov's direct orders. Stockhausen gave us this small device with legs that was given to him by Sechenov. This will help us get into the VDNH. Stockhausen runs off and we, well, are left to fend to ourselves again. We finally find our way into the VDNH compound after ziplining in. And, oh no, <laughs> this is a HOG-7 unit and is typically used as a civilian gardening robot. How is this thing so lethal? Anyway, we eventually take it out and make our way down the long flight of stairs to the VDNH's entrance. Charles makes it very clear that on Monday, a few days away, will be the global launch of Collective 2.0. All of the highest ranking officers and leaders from the Soviet Union will be there to see the unveiling of this project so we need it fixing by then. However, as we attempt to open the door, it doesn't seem to work. Something seems to be jamming the mechanism, so of course, we need to unjam it to get inside. There's some really important dialogue throughout this part of the playthrough speaking around the Bureau's motivations and Comrade Molotov, and also potentially Sechenov's too. Comrade Molotov and his commission want to steal the fruits of Sechenov's labor two days before the launch of Collective 2.0. This malfunction is the perfect scenario for showing the Commission that Sechenov is incapable of overseeing Facility 3826 and ultimately the polymerization of the Soviet Union, aka Collective 2.0 and the neural polymer injected into people. However, Charles mentions that neither Molotov or Sechenov really care about the casualties of this situation. Both have something to gain from preventing this information around the robots turning on innocents not getting out and becoming known across the globe. No one, aka the US, would believe that it was a bunch of traitors within the Soviet Union responsible for this. But the exact opposite. 
that these robots are dangerous. This means that both Sechenov and Molotov share a vested interest in ending this nightmare quickly as possible. This is a common power struggle between two people. Instead of the government sending troops into the facility 3826 to destroy these hostile robots, arrest Petrov or other methods, Sechenov is doing everything that he possibly can to conceal this tragedy, including hiding it from the government. Because the Bureau want to take Collective away from Sechenov. They want him to fail. They want him to look like he's not worthy of controlling it. Everything that he's built, taken away by someone with a badge. Molotov wants to jail Sechenov so that he can take over Collective and the Neuropolymer program. However, the main goal with Collective is that everyone on this program is equal. Everyone is hooked up to the same data store. So how can someone be the leader? How could Comrade Molotov or Sechenov be the leader of Collective? For example, high-ranking Communist Party members will have more authority in Collective than ordinary citizens. That's a given, right? There has to be someone who can take responsibility, like a mayor, a prime minister or someone like that. Without that one authoritative leader, no one would be able to make important decisions if there was no leader, right? However, this isn't necessarily true in some cases. You see, Collective is a collective mind, having all of humanity merge into one. Mankind will instantly know everything anyone wants to express. So, just from this information and knowing all of this, people can come to a conclusion on how to solve things by knowing everything about everyone. People will connect to Collective through a neural connector, the thing that you see on the side of people's heads, a thought device. This is for ordinary citizens. However, individuals in privileged leadership positions will have a special engraved connector that grants them overall higher priority on the network. All of these leaders are equal, but Collective can only be launched via something called the Alpha Connector. It's the key to everything, including assigning discretionary authority to people. So, Dr. Sechenov has the Alpha Connector right now, and Comrade Molotov wants to remove Sechenov from his post, kick him out of the facility, and take the Alpha Connector for himself to be the number one leader of Collective. The number of deaths are of little concern to either of them right now. What we do know is that Comrade Molotov wants to take control of Collective and that's why he's on his way here right now to jail Sechenov and take the overall project for himself. I hope you guys are still with me after that. This game just loves to explain really key story plot points in random places and trying to piece them together can be quite difficult. If you are stuck with any points or confused, leave me in the comments down below and I'll do my best to reply to people and also people in the community will reply too. Anyway, we finally unjam the doorway and enter the VDNH. Stockhausen radios and tells us that Comrade Molotov has left Moscow and he's on his way here right now. We must get there as soon as possible. So we push through and reach the main desk of the VDNH, and out walks a Tereshkova robot. However, in order for us to access drill mode, we must find her old assistant that was taken from her and ripped apart by a bunch of other robots. Two Tereshkova robots are required in order to activate this mode, the drill mode. So we go and find each individual body part, which you can imagine has taken me ages. <laughs> this other robot is called Claire, and we need to find her arm, head, leg, and some other parts. Again, more really important dialogue at different points of this section, and it's all broken up, so I'm gonna try my best to summarize it for everyone and just try to skip past the less important parts. We ask Charles what these special neural connectors look like that Sechenov's team would wear. The ones of higher authority and these would have the Greek letter Gamma engraved on them and worn on their right arm, like a bracelet. However, there were once connectors called beta connectors. These were the first experimental prototypes of the neuro connectors with these discretionary authority ingrained within them. However, nobody knows where they are or what happened to them. They were just a test project and nobody knows if they actually carried on or not. However, we then ask Charles about Sechenov's Alpha Connector. We've never seen Sechenov wear a bracelet, so could his Alpha Connector look a bit different? Charles then goes on to mention that it does, and it's very unique, and it's guarded by the Ballerina Twins, his personal bodyguards. Comrade Major, us, mentioned that these twins remind him of something. 
To which Charles responds, what, in a pretty smug way? Almost like he knows something that we don't, which I thought was a really interesting thing when first playing through. And this is going to blow your mind when we get to the end of the video, so stick around for it. However, why would Sechenov take the Beta Connector away and decommission them? Why are they not used functionally today? The ones that these would have been given to would have been provided with discretionary authority. Sechenov wasn't convinced that there was any need for it within Collective. He originally wanted total equality, but Molotov's scheme changed his mind. However, we mustn't forget, the Alpha Connector exists from the beginning as well. If Setinov wanted complete equality from the start, then why would he create a, a connector that allows him to lead the rest? So after the whole beta connector idea flopped and done a huge U-churn, we decided to create a new method of discretion, neural connectors. This is what is directly injected into a person, rather than having them to physically wear one of these connectors to show that you have this authority. However, this was only offered to members of the USSR, and everyone else, including other countries, will only have access to the standard version, which will only be through the Thought Connector itself. So what are these Beta Connectors? Why give people this authority? What does it do for these people? Well, the Beta Connectors are there for a select set of users, allowing them to be a part of Collective without them actually being a part of it. So they have total autonomy whilst retaining access to the informational network of Collective. However, if these beta rings were to be placed on, I don't know, robots, for example, personal robots of a person, no one else within Collective would be able to control them. So using this outbreak as an example and the ballerina twins, they've not turned on Sechenov or any of the others because they could have had these rings on them meaning they're on a completely separate network to Collective, whilst still being ingrained within it. So, if, for example, Petrov took over and encoded a virus of combat mode, the twins would not be affected by it because they're on a separate network, which is controlled by Sechenov. These twins can't be hacked, controlled, or anything like that. So, after Dr. Sechenov created these new Gamma connectors, he must have destroyed the old Beta connectors, right? He will tell you that's right but only the technology used to manufacture these beta connections was destroyed. They were known as experimental rings, removed from all record and declared as recycled. However, Sechenov kept them as souvenirs and they're somewhere in the facility. When we found Petrov's body the first time, Sechenov asked us on the radio if we'd found golden rings on him. Could these be the golden rings that he was referring to? The beta connectors? These were in Sechenov's Science Center here on Facility 3826, but disappeared after the malfunction. So someone has them. Anyway, we finally build Claire and the drill is activated. Just in time. The elevator in front of us opens and out walks a group of our gentleman soldiers, followed by Comrade Molotov. Stockhausen tries his best to play the current situation down in the facility and plays it off as everything being under control and that we've dealt with it. However, the giant blood splatter on the floor in front of him doesn't reassure Comrade Molotov too much until we play it off as it just being paint. Dr. Sechenov couldn't be here in person, so he shows up on a glass monitor in the VDNH. Molotov calls him out for playing a dangerous game here. The current local malfunction, robots switching into combat mode, is actually a potential worldwide catastrophe. If this can happen in the Soviet Union right now, imagine what it would look like if this was activated on a global scale. However, Sechenov is very concerned by this. He did everything he could to keep this from the Bureau, and everyone around him was very tight-lipped also. So how does Comrade Molotov know of this outbreak? Here, Molotov mentioned, it was from Viktor Petrov, Sechenov's lead engineer, and an honored citizen, he says, of the Soviet Union. However, Sechenov tells him that Petrov was sentenced to prison for committing treason, so how can he be trusted? Well, Molotov seems to think on the contrary. He states that Sechenov is in direct violation of Soviet laws, and as a minister, he should know the consequences of breaking these laws. Molotov pulls out an official Procurator General's Decree, which is an official order enforced by the Soviet governing body against Sechenov and his project, Collective. The upcoming launch of Collective on Monday, two days from now, will be cancelled completely, and Sechenov will be the subject of a full-fledged investigation. However, Sechenov wants a chance to speak with Comrade Molotov in person, so he agrees to meet him 
at the VDNH in person in 15 minutes. Stockhausen meets Sechenov at the landing pad, and we, well, we stay down here. But something's wrong. Comrade Major completely blacks out, and when he wakes, we're in a really unfamiliar place. Come to me. Walk around outside and everything is frozen in time, with objects surrounding us looking very out of the ordinary. As we move through this strange place, we hear a voice. We follow the red apples which look to be leading us down a pathway, until finally we reach the end. P3, my boy. You're alive. Uh, I guess so, yeah. Comrade Sechenov! The government commission... they're dead. Molotov's body is here. What about the others? How many people were with him? F Fifteen or so. Some of them may have survived. Find out. Uh, what the fuck happened here? Who the fuck did this? Guess the robots got in. You were fortunate to escape unharmed. C Comrade Sechenov, all the members of the Commission are dead. All of them. This is tragic, but it changes nothing. Collective must still be activated. I couldn't agree more, but what should we do with the dead Politburo member? We don't have a lot of options here. Right? Handle it. Mikhail, head to the radio station and make sure power to the government line has been cut. Make it quick. Uh, yes, sir, but the Kremlin will be expecting a report from Comrade Molotov. I will personally inform the Politburo of this tragedy. Hurry, Mikhail. We don't have much time. Left. Help her. How are you doing, my boy? Not good. I failed you again. This is... too much. It's too much for all of us, this terrible incident. The twins, right and left, seem to be performing some form of ritual in order to deal with the body of Comrade Molotov. Left reaches into the body of right and pulls out a golden tube, in which it activates and splits into two pieces, revealing two keys. They both move over to two large containers and place these keys within. A bathtub full of red polymer was sat behind, and suddenly it grew to resemble a human figure. This red figure hovered over the body of Molotov and picked him up. I'm very conscious of demonetization here by the way, so I'm not going to show all of it. And the body was pulled into the bathtub of this red red polymer and completely dissolved it, discarding any evidence Molotov was even here. Stockhausen then walks towards us, stating that there's a big problem taking place right now. The central collective hub seems to be broadcasting. Someone is trying to send information to the West, trying to reveal this incident to the rest of the Soviet Union and the government. However, there's only two people that would have access to do such a thing, Sechenov and Petrov. But Petrov's dead, right? We found his body, his head completely sliced off. However, Sechenov makes the point that when we found Petrov, we only found his body, not the head. His partner, or girlfriend, Larissa, Larissa Filatova, the one that we encountered at the beginning of the game, is a neurosurgeon of great caliber, meaning that with the technology advances of this facility, anything is possible. She must have been able to save Petrov's head and reattach it to another body, allowing Petrov to come back. Stockhausen traces the signal to one of the scientific centers. Sechenov tasks us to go and find Petrov immediately. We speak with Charles on the way up the elevator. What the hell happened down there? Who killed the government commission? How did we only survive? However, Charles mentioned that once we lost consciousness, he was also disabled, so he couldn't really tell us. But we also used this chance to ask Charles what the hell was that red human looking thing that came out of the bathtub? That red stuff was a neuropolymer data storage. Sechenov mentioned that this was a tribute to the departed. However, what this stuff does is it absorbs all of the knowledge and information from one person's mind 
and uploads that information into their consciousness into a database so that Sechenov can still have access to their consciousness, memories, and expertise. This is the exact way Professor Zakharov died as well, the doctor that we were told about in Vavilov. However, why did it look like a person? Well, this is Dr. Sechenov's idea. Comrade Major refers to this thing as the Jellyman, so I'm also going to refer to it as the Jellyman just so it's a bit easier. He wanted this Jellyman to have the ability to move independently. This polymer is as loyal to Dr. Sechenov as the Ballerina Twins, and will always remain near him as an additional security measure. Meaning, this thing can move freely and has the ability to attack people if it's needed, because it can sneak up behind people and dissolve them immediately without leaving a single trace or anyone knowing that it happened to them. It makes you think, did Professor Sakharov really fall into this polymer? Hmm. Anyway, we need to make our way to Sechenov's computational center to stop this signal from being broadcasted by Petrov. Communication outside of facility 3826 isn't really possible through normal frequencies, due to Sechenov ensuring that blocks are all over the network to stop Petrov from doing so, and the word from getting out about the robots. However, there's still one line that hasn't yet received the same treatment, and that is Sechenov's secret and personal line into the government. The feed that somehow Granny Zena had access to when we were in a cabin. Petrov looks to be trying to impersonate Sechenov on this line and trying to tell the rest of the Soviet government about this outbreak, preventing the launch of Collected 2.0 and really hindering it as well. So we need to get there as soon as possible. Look what we have here. Petrov stuns and knocks us out. And we wake a short time later. Death. I just knocked him out. He's unconscious, okay? To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the secret troubles and by opposing him. You know, it's, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. I don't agree. I'm sorry, Larissa, but I don't understand. He ruined everything. And you, you. I'm a doctor. Enough people have died today. People, Larissa! He's an animal! He'll rip anybody's throat out of such enough orders him to! Victor, he's tied up. I'll program a treatment and then we'll go. Go where? No one's coming for us. And this fucking lunatic's ruined our escape plan! I know. We'll come up with something. I doubt it. <laughs> Just let me go, and I promise I'll make it quick and painless. So Sechenov's talk and talk, huh? Look, he just came to and he's already threatening us. <laughs> yeah, I am threatening you. How many people have your robots slaughtered without so much as a warning? Petrov? Two thousand? Three thousand? That's 000? not Victor's fault. Huh? It was a local malfunction. A local malfunction? Then why the shit doesn't your boyfriend have a scratch on him, huh? <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? Isn't it obvious? First Vavilov, then the VDNH. The robots are attacking everyone except you two. Why is that if you're not controlling them? <laughs> Victor, you said you had nothing to do with this. <laughs> and you believed him. What other bullshit has this guy told you? <laughs> oh, man. Victor. I had no choice. A simple malfunction wouldn't have changed anything. How could you? Huh? How could I? You said it yourself! The whole world might end! Huh? No, don't touch me! <laughs> you really didn't tell her anything, did you? <laughs> A big mistake. Hey, what the hell? Hello?
Larissa, wait! Larissa! Nothing can save you now, asshole. Petrov goes chasing after Larissa, and our little robot sets us free. Then we radio to Sechenov and tell him that Petrov has again managed to get away. However, we must find Petrov. He cannot interfere with the launch of Collective. As we make our way out of the building, Petrov radios directly to us, detailing that it's our fault that Larissa won't return his calls and that she's essentially broken up with him. His signal was traced to the Pulzeskia Theatre, so we need to make our way there to try and track him down. We finally enter the theatre, and it's very clear that Petrov knows this place extremely well. He's hiding somewhere on the main stage, creating traps for us along the way, and plenty of puzzles too, trying to slow us down and ultimately kill us, so that he can bring down the collective network. Throughout our time progressing through the theatre though, it's very clear that Petrov is distraught about the loss of his girlfriend Larissa. In fact, he was going to propose to Larissa on the day of Collective's launch, the day they brought the network down for good. However, with him keeping such a big secret from Larissa, and him promising that it was a technical malfunction and not nothing to do with him, she can't seem to face him anymore. The amount of lives lost because of Petrov's doing, and the simple fact he denied it at every chance he got, she wanted no more of it. So Petrov has turned pretty crazy, lost his mind in fact, and now he doesn't really care what happens, he just wants this network to be completely shut down, and his only goal of this is to bring down Collective for good. We're getting very close to Petrov at this point, and he's doing everything that he can to stop us from getting him. Whilst we're solving one of his puzzles, Petrov begins to talk more around what he knows. Apparently, we have no idea how insidious our real enemy is. Not even Sechenov truly understands it. What we're really all going to end up with is emptiness, powerlessness, and a mushroom cloud, meaning a nuclear bomb, probably from the US or going to the US, one of the two, or other countries around the world. The feeling that you have been had, taken around the bend, played by someone, something. We asked Charles about this in a bit more detail, why is Petrov saying that Collective is going to kill us all? Is Collective dangerous? Collective itself cannot be dangerous, but the owner of the program can be. We don't believe Sechenov will do that, as his goal for everyone is to be equal. Which again brings back the question, if everyone was meant to be equal, why create the Alpha Connector? We finally get to the backstage door, and as we walk inside, there's Petrov. Look, I can't play this cutscene because the music will be copyrighted, so I'm just going to summarise it here. Collective was originally designed to be a programme to make everyone equal in terms of knowledge and minds across the globe, right? Also giving the person the ability to control robots for terraforming, gardening, cooking, completing strenuous tasks, or tasks that you don't want to complete. However, these robots, during the planning and development stage, were ingrained with a combat mode. Petrov couldn't have reprogrammed the code for every robot in Facility 3826. Writing a single functional algorithm for a single robot model would take weeks, months, and doing all of the robots in this facility would take years of preparation behind closed doors. But the fact that this combat mode was already programmed into these robots during the design phase of these robots' creation is the giant concern here, and it's where we're starting to get real picture of what's going on. Sure, no one ever thought this combat mode would be activated within the Soviet Union, but Sechenov's plan for this project are way worse than what we've seen so far, and he must be stopped because of it. We tell Petrov to switch these robots out of combat mode, but he just straight up refuses to do so. All of his plan is already in motion. He suddenly throws a box to us containing two gold metal rings, and then the robot slices his head straight off. Again, can't really show all this, demonetization is a big thing, so I've got to keep it to a very, very minimum. We radio into Sechenov to tell him what had happened. However, this time, we have Petrov's head. Sechenov sends a robot with a container in which we would store Se Petrov's head and keep it safe. We place Petrov's head inside this container, probably in the event so Sechenov can use the neuropolymer to absorb it and absorb the knowledge and then get the codes that way. So we make our way out of the theatre, and Charles asks us how we are. Comrade Major is losing it at this point. He's lugging a human head around, and Sechenov and everyone else is just fine with that. But not only this, 
the rings that Petrov gave to him. Throughout the entire story, we've been constantly asked by people about these golden rings. Every time we ask what they are, we're kept in the dark. But why? What are these golden rings? What are they used for? Why are these rings so important? And why does everyone seem to be interested in them? So we enter the lift and make our way to the service, and Stockhausen radios to us. We will meet him at the Pavlov complex. However, he asks us the same question here. Just one more question. No, Filatova wasn't there. I understand. You didn't find any gold rings on Petrov's body, did you? Two rings with better one and better two engraved on the inside? No. Although this question from Stockhausen is even more interesting because he doesn't just ask about the rings, but he mentions that they were engraved beta one and beta two. Earlier on in the video, Charles was telling us about two rings that were concepted and called beta connectors. However, they vanished within Sechenov's scientific facility. Just as the outbreak occurred, these connectors would allow two beings wearing each ring from listening into collective without actually being a part of the network and granting them discretionary authority on the network. Or if they're placed on a robot, it means that those robots will not listen to the people in the collective network. Everyone wants these rings so badly because they work and people want to have the chance to listen into collective whilst not physically being a part of it. However, as we get to the surface and walk outside, Granny Zena radios into us. We tell her about Petrov, and again, she asks us the same question. Each person that's asked, even though we have these rings in our possession, we've denied having them, saying that we don't have them. Charles questions this and asks us why we keep denying that we have the rings. And Comrade Major is sick of everyone deceiving him. He's pondering what Petrov told him in the theatre. Combat mode was programmed in these robots during construction and couldn't have possibly been able to do it himself. I mean, look at Petrov. He couldn't fight at all. He wouldn't know the first thing about combat. How would he know how to program this level of combat into each bot? An example of this, a robot that we fought in the theatre before we left. It was a construction robot, so why does it have missiles attached? And Petrov couldn't have armed each and every other model of robot with weaponry like this, because he's not an engineer, he's a programmer. All of this hardware was there upon the construction of these robotic models. All Petrov did was reprogram the central hub to make the robots believe that people were invading as an army. So this begs the question, why could a construction robot be armed with missiles, a flying robot to assist with maneuvering around the facility of 3826 to be armed with a machine gun and a rail gun on a heavy duty robot to move heavy duty items? It doesn't make sense. Stating that our hunch may not be a hunch at all, when we were watching the live feed with Granny Zena, where Sechenov was being interrogated by Comrade Major, do you even realise that if the Americans find out that your robots can be switched to combat mode, Collective 2.0 will be dead in the water? This statement doesn't sound like the Politburo and Comrade Molotov were surprised to hear that these robots had a combat mode, but in fact, that they knew from the very start. They were in on all of this. This whole project, the project called Atomic Heart, is a project for the Politburo and the Soviet Union to try and conquer the US and the entire world. Anyway, we progress down to the Pavlov complex. Throughout this though, the Atomic Heart project becomes much more apparent of what it entails. Sending our civilian robots off to America, having them work in power plants, the headquarters of high-ranking US officials, the military, and many other places. When combat mode then activates, there will be enough of these robots around the country to take them by surprise, killing everyone in their way and seizing these landmarks. But why would the person who programmed the combat mode want to kill regular civilians, farmers and scientists? It becomes very clear why people want these golden rings so badly here. A person is able to remove their thought device at any given time, however when they do, they're no longer a part of collective and can no longer control these robots, which means that if someone else does enable combat mode, then their robot will turn straight against them. However, if a robot has one of these rings on them, and even if their thought device is removed, it will only ever listen to you, so you can connect your device 
on at any given time, disconnected at any given time, and your robot will not turn against you. This is why Granny Xena wanted them so bad, and even Stockhausen as well. However, we finally enter the facility and walk inside with Petrov's head. And there is Stockhausen and the Ballerina Twins. Again, demonetization, I'm going to show nothing of the head or anything that looks like blood, so that's why there's a couple of bits cutting and that's why it might look a bit choppy. We hand over the head and he's placed into a neuropolymer container, which will of course upload all of Petrov's knowledge from his head into this central polymer database, storing his memories there for good allowing us to disarm the combat robots. However, as we're doing so, we see someone running towards the room. It's Larissa. She throws a grenade into the room and the neuropolymer flows out onto the ground after the explosion and covers Stockhausen. However, we suddenly black out again and enter this dream-like world. What keeps causing this? We make our way through to the end and finally we wake up. Everything is in complete ruins. Where's Larissa? She hid before the explosion. So what happened to Stuck? Stockhausen was knocked into a vat of polymer by the explosion and is now deceased. You hypocrite. I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. Huh. Some doctor you are, you grenade-tossing bitch. And we move on to find a way out of here. In the elevator, though, we receive a radio from Larissa. She firstly apologizes for almost killing us with a grenade, but then tells us that we can't trust Sechenov and that we trust him way too much. He's seriously keeping us in the dark about a lot of different things, and she tells us that we need to see things with our own eyes and that we're not going to believe the truth. She's situated at an old lighthouse and invites us to push there to see exactly what she means. Underneath this lighthouse is the Academy of Consequence. We finally reach the top of the compound, as we walk outside, Charles insists that we destroy the beta connectors. We question him as to why he's so insistent that we destroy them, and here he mentions something really kind of worrying, something that shows how much of a puppet Comrade Major really is to Sechenov. We can continue to lie to Sechenov, Granny Zina, and anyone else about not having the rings, but when we return to Sechenov and we still have these rings in our possession, all items that we have is recorded in Charles's log and it cannot be erased. The first thing that we would do is review the log once those beta connectors, so he's going to get them. However, if anyone gets them, it's going to cause huge ramifications. We play this off for now and jump down into a canyon, and there is a beached whale. But wait, what the hell? Yes, pump thing killed that whale. Damn. The dewdrop is the latest design in the field of biomechanics. Simply, it is a hydraulic pump. Isn't that what I just said? We take out the robot and climb up the rock face. And again, Charles brings up the rings. So we bring them from our inventory and throw them into the sea. Done. Happy now? Good decision, comrade major. However, it's now time to make our way to the top of the lighthouse. As we open the door, suddenly, a swarm of owls show up. But don't shoot us. Crap, what a surprise. Why'd they freeze up? The access code has been successfully extracted from Petrov's neuropolymer memory. Combat mode has been disabled, and the robots have returned to their normal status. Well done, my boy. Searching off them radios in stating that the access code has been successfully extracted from Petrov's neuropolymer memory. Sechenov tells us to come back to Chalame and take some well-deserved leave. We've earned it. However, not before visiting Larissa in the lighthouse. We finally make our way inside and go downstairs, and it was not what we were expecting. What do we have here? We take a seat in this chair, and suddenly we're sent flying down an elevator. that the unscheduled acceleration was caused by the elevator access system being hacked. Otherwise, Dr. Falatova would not have been able to initiate it. Ah, so she hacked the system. Kind of like how all these poor bastards got hacked to bits. However, to our surprise, there looks to be some form of rapture below the water. A small underground-like city. Wildlife circling the area, 
a massive spherical dome in the distance. All of this was here this entire time. We finally get to the bottom and there is Larissa. Let me try to give you a different perspective and then you can decide how to handle things. Do you know how Sechenov is planning to use Collective? What he's going to do with it? After Collective launches, people will be able to control robots with their minds and they won't be able to stab each other in the back anymore. Sounds nice. I used to think that way too, but that's not how things really are. Collective isn't just about controlling robots. Sechenov will be able to control everyone who's a part of Collective. Collective is diabolical, Nyechaev. It's even worse than slavery. Bullshit. It's just the same old chain of command, but on a virtual network. What's so awful about that? Come on, see for yourself. We follow Larissa into the lab, and then it's all revealed. Well, are you ready? Disable polarization. The fuck is this place? A haunted house or something? It's a tomb of the mind. The volunteers who lay the foundation for Collective. The first few groups of subjects all died. Group 30 went insane. Group 73 killed themselves. Group 101 killed each other. Group 204 was the most successful. They all survived. Their consciousness is now in an imaginary world. We call it Limbo. And their bodies are here, under my complete control. Want me to make them do something? Why? To show that I'm not lying. Whatever. Line them up. Keep going. Uh, the fat guy. Tell him to jump. He could use Just it. Just him? Why don't I make them all jump? After all, we all live in a communist society. Goddamn you, jump! This is insane. Why do you people even do this shit? Fuck. Poor bastards. No, that's where you're wrong. Chemically speaking, they're all perfectly happy. That's what Collective is all about. The entire world will be just like Why this. would Sechenov want to turn everyone into a bunch of idiots? Was he trying to make fun of the world by making people run around naked and act like animals? <laughs> no. We were able to prevent the degradation of individual consciousness. Memories, behavior, speech patterns are all preserved. But there's one thing they won't be able to avoid. The complete loss of their free will. We gotta stop this. Stop this? That's what Victor was trying to do. You got in his way, and now it's too late. Your boyfriend lost his mind and killed people. He tried to tell me Sechenov taught the robots to kill during the design phase. Why would Boss do that? Why? Why did he design Collective to be a mind control system? Why does he need those special neuro controllers? Sechenov wants to enslave the entire world. I'm sorry, but if you don't understand that, you're an idiot. <sighs> the boss would never do that. He would, and he will, on Monday. All this is really hard to swallow. But I'll help you. Whatever you're planning, I'm in. <laughs> you're willing to turn on Sechenov? After what you just showed me? Yeah. I want to hear what he's got to say. As we exit the car, Comrade Major starts having these visions, and hears a voice, seeing colours all over the place, almost like lights. We first pass them off as a headache, and continue to follow Larissa. Why did you help me? Perhaps. 
perhaps because I care? And besides, it's not about you. Well, not only you. If you worked here, then why didn't you try to stop this? I thought it was for the best. I thought it was for the good of the entire Soviet Union. But when I realized what was really going on, I had to bide my time, wait for the right moment. Victor and I risked everything and... You know the rest. Fine, moving on. The test subject is not leaving limbo. Inject your uh, Hey, Major. I'm fine. My head's been killing me lately. I've been seeing things. This is one hell of a job, let me tell you. It won't hurt, Sergeant. You won't even remember a thing. Hallucinations are serious business. Well, I am a neurosurgeon. I can probably help, if everything ends well. No thanks. A little vacation will fix me right up. I mean, if this all ends well. Hmm. I just don't feel comfortable around these people. Huh, well, just you wait. Soon this is gonna happen all over the Soviet Union, and later the whole world. Then you'll see all people stripped of their free will. You know... Free will doesn't guarantee that a person won't be a scumbag. What? Are you justifying atrocities? Atrocities? What atrocities? If they're volunteers, coming here was their choice. It's got nothing to do with me. You're a monster! Affirmative. That's enough. I'm too busy to chat right now. Very well. Enjoy the view. Resist, my darling. Resist. Ah, fuck. I'm so sick of these goddamn hallucinations. Do you see colorful spots before your eyes? Does your perception of the world change? Yeah, exactly. Do you know what this shit is? You were crossing into limbo, but it can't be stopped. How did you interrupt it? I don't know. It's like that lump of polymer is calling out to me. A big, teardrop-shaped one. Right there, straight above us. Do you see it? There's nothing there. What do you mean? I'm looking right at it. Oh, crap. Now it's gone. It's a hallucinatory reaction, a side effect of the surgery you underwent. The reaction of a damaged brain to the presence of a neuropolymer implant. What are you even talking about? What implant? Did Sechenov not tell you? So you don't know what's happening to you? Charles, do you know what's happening with my head? I am not detecting any internal changes, Major. But your Vossot polymer extension is clearly receiving an unidentified stream of external data. What's that interface? Who are you talking to? It's a chatting artificial librarian, an AI in my polymer glove. It doesn't matter. Charles? What are you talking about? Charles? Wait, Charles. What data? What Vossod polymer extension? The Vossod polymer extension was developed using data from experiments conducted by Dimitri and myself. What? Yourself? And why are you calling Dr. Sechenov Dimitri? Who are you? Comrade Major, this will be difficult to explain. I am... Charles! Why the fuck are you all staticky? What the hell is going on? Keep it together, Major. If what I'm thinking is true, I should be able to access the Archive right now. There will be records about you. State your name and personal access code. Crispy critters. Invalid name. Fine, I'll hack in. Not so fast. Name Charidan Zaharov. Code Fluffy. Code accepted. Access granted. Charles, are you there? Nothing. Nothing. So, what is Charles then? Long story short. Your Charles is Professor Chariton Zaharov. Huh, that was short. So how could he be Zaharov? Professor Zaharov was developing the collective subsystems and worked on the module. The one you have inside you. They told us he ran a number of experiments on himself. The result was disastrous and unpredictable. On himself? <laughs> was he an idiot or something? Oh, he certainly wasn't an idiot. Zaharov was a misanthrope obsessed with science. I don't think he cared about what happened to his body all that much. As soon as we mentioned Charles, Larissa knew straight away. It's an abbreviation. Chariton? Charles? 
Charles standing for chatting artificial librarian. That's why he made such a big deal about it at the beginning of the game, char less and char itun. Zakharov is the consciousness inside of our glove, and Sechenov planted him there to guide us through, one of the brightest Soviet geniuses. So Larissa opens the door and we walk inside. We search the facility for three videotapes, each revealing more and more information around what happened to us and our previous life. We input the first tape and here we start to learn more. The events in Bulgaria left the agents badly injured. Technically speaking, they were clinically dead. Agent Blesna could not be saved. Since Agent Plutonium's condition was less severe, it was possible to return him to combat readiness. However, his nearly destroyed limbs had to be amputated and replaced with the latest prostheses. Yeah, I already know half my body's prosthetic. What else is new? These are just general observations. Find another recording. playback. Following his recovery, the agent's personality was altered significantly, including his behavioral and speech patterns. Because of this, I made the decision to remove the agent from the Argentum unit. In order to prevent any possibility of memory recidivism, Plutonium received a new call sign, P3, and is now under my direct command and observation. P3's contact with Argentum has been kept to a minimum, and Argentum personnel have been warned against mentioning the call sign Blesna in P3's presence. Crispy. I'll get another one. What? Sechenov has you on a leash. He does whatever he wants with you. Listen, Doc, he saved my life. Do you think I don't know I'm a test subject? That's my job. So you're a volunteer, huh? Then why are you such a disobedient test subject? Because before they always told me what they were doing. I'll go get another recording. Procedure. Implant the Voskhod Neuropolymer Brain Function Extension. Objective. Total elimination of destructive impulses triggered by traumatic memories. Patient, Major Sergei Nechayev. Codename, Plutonium. Attempt number three. The first two operations were unsuccessful. The patient suffered a severe brain injury in Bulgaria, which could not be repaired. The damage is of such severity that the patient will likely have to be euthanized. Did you hear that? He wanted to kill you. The frontal lobes are partially destroyed, causing the patient to experience bouts of uncontrollable rage. The patient's steel prostheses render him dangerous to those around him. And that's about your seizures. Due to the incidents of temporary insanity, the patient is immersed in a surreal psychedelic reality that prevents him from accepting the consequences of his aggressive behavior. Uh, I don't get it. Can you translate for me? You're not gonna like it. The patient experiences intense hallucinations. Did you see your wife again, my boy? How? How did you know that? Yet a Voskhod implant will give the patient artificial memories and allow him to overcome his obsession with his deceased wife. Your wife. It's all bullshit. I've never been married. With Voskhod, we can send the agent's consciousness into the imaginary world of limbo via a pulse aimed directly at his pituitary gland, switching the Major into combat mode on command. I'd like to add that I am strongly opposed. What a load of crap. I mean, there's no fucking way. I'm afraid there is. Sachinov can send your mind to your own private paradise with the push of a button. And my body? Your body will kill whoever he tells it to. Fucking horseshit. What about the hallucinations? Are they also Sechenov? No. The hallucinations are just your brain's defense mechanism. Why the hell should I believe any of this? The boss would never do this to me. Yeah, right. Just like he'd never wipe your wife's existence from your memory. Just like he'd never designed Collective to be a mind control system. Who said Sechenov did any of that stuff? You can't even tell who's in that chair. If you don't believe me, go ask him.
What's the plan, Major? He's waiting for us at Chelome. If we want to stop Sechenov, we'll have to string him along. So you bring me there as your captive? And then what? And then we play it by ear. So that's how it is, Major. Think it over while I try to hack this elevator and get us back to the surface. Uh-huh. Paying attention now, dickbag? Major, I... I have no data about this incident. Trying to make a monkey out of me, are you? Well, join the club. Don't have any data, huh? You've always known about all this. There's a reason you're called Charles, right? You're Char a ton. Zaharov, you son of a bitch. Got an explanation? Huh? There's nothing to explain, Major. You're just as much a Charles to me as I am a perfect stranger to you. First, Sechenov murdered me. Then he turned me into a blob of polymer goo. Then he brainwashed you and manipulated you. How could I trust either of you? That's why I pretended to be the chatting artificial librarian. I wanted to see who was who. Yeah, well... I guess I would have done the same. So what are we gonna do now, huh? What else can we do, Sergei? You and I are friends now, and we know the truth. We need to get to Sechenov, rectify this injustice, and get revenge for what he's done to us. I guess you're right, Chariton. Justice does need to be done. You're a good man, Comrade Major. I hate to say this, but you're the first functional example of an ordinary link in the Collective Network. On Monday, everyone who has undergone polymerization will become just as malleable as you. Shit, I can't let that happen. Listen, the fucking gadget, the thought device, you can just take it off. Unfortunately, that won't help anyone. It just makes things worse. How come? <laughs> Because all your thoughts are useless. A polymerized person's signal will be transmitted to robots and other equipment via their thought controller. But it is not what makes them a part of Collective. The thought device can be removed, but this merely prevents the wearer from being able to make calls and give orders to machines. So how is Sechenov going to keep everybody under control? It's the neuropolymer injection that makes people part of Collective. It embeds itself in the brain and connects it to the neural network once and for all. The effect of this injection cannot be undone. Everyone who gets an injection will be part of Collective forever. But I... Was I really married? What was my wife's name? Ekaterina. And... You aren't going to like what I'm about to tell you, Comrade Major. I've heard that before, but I doubt anything could surprise me now. You and your wife served with the Argentum unit. Ekaterina, or Katya, as you called her, was a highly qualified agent. As a child, she studied ballet and made significant achievements in both dance and martial arts. Ballet and martial arts? Are you trying to tell me the boss is metal twins? No way. This is total BS. The boss would never do something like that. Just look at me, Comrade Major. After I died, my consciousness was transplanted into this glove. After your wife died, her consciousness could not be saved. But Sechenov uploaded an imprint of her professional skills into his bodyguard's matrices. This is... Holy shit. Fuck me, this can't be a... We've got a ride, Major. We can get out of here. Larissa finally hacks the elevator, and we make our way up to the top. However, suddenly, we start to go into limbo again. Someone is doing this, and we don't know who at the moment resulting into us, of course, go crazy in this fit of rage. Dr. Sechenov just held a press conference in which he completely denied rumors about civilian robots malfunctioning at Facility 3826. The facility is back to full operational capacity, <sighs> and the red alert Finally will be back with very us, soon. Sonny. You took Collective a real pounding, didn't you? Will be you were pretty close to staying there for good. Where? You tell me. How am I supposed to know where you are when you're on the bloody rampage? You were a nice boy when my daughter was around, but ever since she passed away, you do nothing but sulk and fly off the handle at the drop of a hat. Nothing but blood and ripped off heads everywhere. Disgraceful. What's your daughter got to do with me? <sighs> my Katinka. Our Katinka. <laughs> they played hell with your memory, Sonny. 
Lady, what are you talking about? She was my daughter, but she was your... Ekaterina Nechaeva, codenamed Blesna, member of the Argentum Spec Ops squad. So you must be... Your mother-in-law, you stupid ignoramus. You worked for Sechenov until those Bulgarian terrorists blew you up. Katya didn't make it. Then Sechenov turned you into a monster. Yeah, I may have heard something about that. Why are you just sitting there if you already knew? I've been keeping an eye on you ever since. I figured there must be some humanity somewhere in you. Sorry, lady, but you figured wrong. My past, my present, it's all gone. W wait, where's Larissa? She's everywhere. You scattered her to the four winds. would you like? Anything will do. I just need to blow my head off. Great idea. Just blow your own damn brains out and be that done with down, it. lady. Then such an off can turn everyone into mindless meatbags. First the Soviet <laughs> Union, then the rest Fine, of the world. Fine, I get it. If you get it, then get up. I'll give you weapons, lots of them. But only if you promise me you'll put that freak down once and for all. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? Listen to your elders, Major. Comrade Sechenov's deeds demand vengeance. What? What is this shit, Sergei? It is me, Zinaida. Chariton Zaharov. Chariton? You devil! You're alive! In a sense. An evil wizard turned me into polymer goo. Wait a fucking minute. Are you telling me you've known Granny Zena this whole time? Keeping secrets can be very useful, Major. They haven't let us down yet. Useful to who? You keeping secrets is letting me Sechenov down. Sechenov must be off his rocker if he's doing this kind of stuff to people. Wait a second. What about Katya, Kartinka? Could she still be alive? It's possible, but in what state? Just look at me. I'm not sure I'm better off, but I don't have hard data at this time. I'm begging you, Sergei. Sechenov has to die! Jeez, get off my back already! Crispy critters. What the hell is going on around here? On the one hand, I've got lying, manipulative dicks who claim to be noble Avengers. On the other, I've got a Soviet scientist and member of the Academy who wants to enlighten all mankind and use me to get rid of assholes. According to the manipulative dicks, that is. <sighs> Whatever, lady. Why don't you show me what's now in that arsenal of yours? Sonny. We eventually move inside the building and make our way upstairs. And here, we see the motivations of Sechenov and the goal of Atomic Heart. The Atomic Heart project was approved by the Secret Congress of the CPSU Central Committee on the 14th of February, 1951. The main goal of this project is the suppression of the USA. This will start with seizing military points of interest and facilities, followed by the disconnection and shutting down of nuclear power plants. This will completely deactivate the atomic heart of America, resulting in the complete surrender of all government and the transfer of power to the top leadership of the Soviet Union. But how will they do that? Well, they will practically give away the robots to them, let them build up and reach a particular quantity that becomes large enough that they can just take over all of the power plants and cut off all the power to America. So the plan isn't to blow up America, it's to deprive them of electricity so that the Soviet Union can control it. All of these robots in the US are controlled by the Jelly Man, the red man that we saw earlier made of neuropolymer, and only Sechenov has access to him. Only the Jelly Man, the huge data array where all the knowledge is absorbed, has access to that, and over the last few years, there's a hell of a lot of this neuropolymer around the world, so everyone one day will be a part of the collective network, ingrained within it, even without needing a thought device. If you have a little bit of polymer inside you, you're a part of the network. We finally reach Sechenov's door and walk inside of his office.
Boss? Protect. Well, Cheriton, are you proud of yourself? You, Larissa, and Zenaida have certainly been busy. But, Sergei, I wouldn't have expected you to be quite so gullible, my boy. Silence! You messed with my head. You wiped my memory. Am I a toy to you like those other people connected to Collective? Who the fuck Calm do you down, think you Sergei. are? Calm Sergei. I can see you're terribly upset. It's okay, I don't blame you. But you, Cheriton, you were supposed to help the boy not pull his strings like a puppet. Me? Don't you blame this on me? I'm not the one trying to deprive everyone of their free will, turning them into mindless puppets. It wasn't my choice to be a talking pile of goo, either. You're glad it happened, aren't you? You use everything and everyone to achieve your goal, including me and your agent. Admit it! How dare you! I lost you both, then saved your lives. You're both scientific miracles. You were... You are my best friend, Sheraton. And the Major is like a son to me. And those two are like daughters, right? And everyone you're going to connect to Collective, everyone whose minds you're going to control, who are they to you? Millions of foster kids? Everyone is just grist for your mill, Dimitri. I want to give mankind a spectacular future. Unimaginable achievements. I want to give them a path to the star. Both of you, shut up! Get your hands up! Some goddamn wizard you are. Tell him to stand down. I'm counting to three. One! What a shame. Two! It's a shame you've escalated this situation without even trying to resolve it peacefully. But I won't let you stand in the way of progress. Right, left, terminate. We finally defeat the twins. And then the craziest thing happens. You lousy you piece don't of understand. shit. Cheriton's manipulating you. He gained access to the Voskhod module in your brain and started sending you to limbo. I was busy getting ready for the collective update, so I didn't realize it right away. He's the one who killed Molotov. Tell me, Cheriton, did you do the same thing to Dr. Volatova? <laughs> did you use my agent to tear her limb from limb? I'm sick of your hypocrisy, Dimitri. I did your dirty work while you stayed squeaky clean. But they didn't deserve to die. Why have you done this? <clears throat> you motherfucker, this whole time. I've been uh, good uh, enough for you, Major. Uh, your uh, job is done. Uh, Three, my boy, get up, get up. What do you want? I want all this to end, Dimitri. I want your pathetic human race to realize it has no future. It's time for it to step aside. Make way for the next phase of its evolution. Me. Jarrison, you're pure evil. What? What are you going to do to humanity and collective? You should not call something evil just because you cannot comprehend it. Evil is an abstract concept, and your thinking is limited. You are a human, a species that will soon be extinct. I realized when I stopped being human myself. Your limitations prevent you from seeing the truth. Dumb humans don't want to evolve. All they want is comfort and satisfaction on someone else's dime. You never wanted to join with the massive array. No. Don't, Charity. 
No. The Argentum unit entered Dr. Sechenov's office and found no trace of the doctor. According to partially reconstructed footage, it appears the humanoid neuropolymer object approached Dr. Sechenov's body and then completely consumed it. After the events described in the report, the unidentified humanoid neuropolymer object left Dr. Sechenov's office and vanished. Right, 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 right. Okay, let, let me just spend a minute here summarizing the ending of this, because this is just a bit mental. And this took me way off way off guard, to be honest. Let me know if, in the comments if it did for you as well. Chariton Sakara's motivations were that humanity had run its course and he'd found this out when he became part of the neuropolymer. There was only so much that we could accomplish as a species, space travel, augmentations, collective, but never be advanced enough to take us to that next step. However, when he fell into this pool and became this neuropolymer, or as we know him, the jelly man, he's able to move around on his own free will, even in this form. And this was by design of Sechenov, so it was the perfect fit. The neuropolymer will not fall under the same constraints as humanity. They don't need oxygen to breathe. They can transform into whatever form they want to. And they're ingrained directly within the collective network. Chariton will take human evolution to the next level and to a place never before thought of. He destroyed the Alpha Connector so that no one is able to escape collective and no one's able to control it either. And with the beta connectors and the gamma connectors gone from the twins, there's no one that has authority. You're either in it or out of it. Chariton consumed Sechenov's body whole, and we, well, we went into limbo. They're in the distance. Katia. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Atomic Heart explained completely and also walked through and summarized. If you did get this far into the video, comment crispy critters down below. As Major said this enough throughout the playthrough to drive me insane. So <laughs> it'd be great. If you got this far into the video, comment it down below and I'll give you a like. And uh, obviously I love heart on the, uh, the comments as well. Be much appreciated. Ultimately, I thought it was quite a good storyline. It was quite strong as well. I thought the overall backstory was really interesting and it was just interesting to learn about it. I think they could have handled the storytelling in a bit of a different way because it was just the way they did it was all over the place and very confusing. But the story itself, I thought was really good. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. Did you like Atomic Heart? Did you not like Atomic Heart? I thought it was good. A review for myself will be coming out in the next couple of days about this game. And yeah, ultimately, let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. But leave a like if you did enjoy, everyone. Subscribe if you guys are brand new for more content like this. And generally, loads more content coming on the channel. Be very, very much appreciated. But without further ado, everyone, we'll see you all next time.